morning, everyone. Good morning. Welcome to First Congregational Church. No matter who you are or where you find yourself on life's journey, you are welcome here with us today. I am Amity Levette, as uh, some of you know, filling in for Pastor Scott, who's out of town this weekend. So uh, bear with me as I lead us in worship today. I want to welcome you all, and we'll start with a few announcements. So if you're interested in joining a small group, keep an eye on your email. Over the next couple of weeks, there will be a sign-up and a Google link form for you uh, if you're interested. So keep your eye on that. There will be more to come. Uh, we plan to try to start those in August. Uh, Pastor Scott will also have a hard copy for sign-up if you don't do the Google in and the, the sign-up geniuses and stuff like that. Uh, there's a River Strings concert coming up on June 8th at 7 p.m. This is a free dulcimer concert here to enjoy, so we encourage you to come and join the local community. Hmm? June 1st. Oh, I have the wrong date in my notes. Okay, June 1st. Thank you. Next weekend. So please come out and join us. It should be a really good time. Uh, this group's come before, I believe, and they've been pretty awesome, so it should be really good. Um, and then there's a couple other things just in your bulletin. The food pantry is looking for strawberry grape jelly, canned mushrooms, canned carrots, and canned pineapple. So if you can spare some of that on your next grocery trip, um, you can help out those in need in the community. And the sound booth is looking for volunteers. Uh, we have our faithful in the back here who always keep everything running, and they're looking for some help. So if you're interested, please uh, see Ken, and he'll get you set up, or Jen, or Doug. All right. Let's uh, stand and rise together and pass the peace of Christ to one another. This is, it's always a good sign when we have to call the church back together because we're so connected with one another. So if you are able, I invite you to rise in spirit and body as we receive our call to worship. Please join me in this morning's call to worship. Credit the Holy One with glory and power. Get The voice speaks and we hear. The voice thunders and creation moves. The voice is strong and mighty, secure and majestic. The li living water refreshes us. The Holy Spirit strengthens us. Bless the name of our God. Amen. Together, our unison prayer of invocation. Spirit of the living God, fall fresh upon us. Renew us by your continued creative acts in the world. Your presence in us is a blessing, a gift. Open up to receive, ponder, and grow as you communicate with your people. In voice, body, and spirit, we worship you and invite your transformative power to be alive among us, at work in us, here we are, O oh, triune God. Here we are. Amen.
receive our scripture this morning. Today is Trinity Sunday. We celebrate that our scriptures speak to us of a creative, mysterious God in three persons and one substance. I could stand up here and try to give you a clever analogy or something to try to illustrate the Trinity and then I'd probably accidentally or maybe on purpose commit a heresy because it's super complicated and yet mysterious. So I'm going to leave you with an image. One of the most beautiful and relatable images I have ever been gifted of the Trinity is from the Greek Orthodox tradition. It's a concept called perichoresis which is a big fancy seminary Greek word, which just means divine dance. So I invite you this morning to think about God in a divine dance in three persons, inviting us into that dance with them. God, the Ruach Elohim, is dancing over the primordial waters in Genesis 1, as we will hear the scripture today, in this moment anticipating what they will call forth, God first mentioned in Hebrew scripture in Genesis 1, 1, in a feminine and plural way. God is mysterious and beautiful, this unified community about to fashion all that is in his, is in her, is in their image. We worship a God who is dancing in perfect relationship with all of their persons, Father, Son, Spirit, Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer, Parent, Christ, Breath, we are invited to join the dance and create along with them. Let us this day receive the word of God for the people of God. So I'm Mike, your resident yogi. (laughs) I like that. Uh, Before I read this, I'd just like to, uh, you walked into this area, this space, And as you did, there was a picture of the creation story out in the entryway point uh, uh, painted by uh, Kay Maniscalco, who I'm plugging because she's my wife. (laughs) So the first scripture lesson today is from Genesis. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was complete chaos and darkness covered the face of the deep while a wind from God swept over the face of the waters. Then God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning on the first day. The second scripture lesson, uh, buckle in, is really long. Uh, is from John. Now there was a Pharisee named Nicodemus, a leader of the Jews. He came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with that person. Jesus answered him, Very truly I tell you, No one can see the kingdom of God without being born from above. Nicodemus said to him, How can anyone be born after having grown old? Can one enter a second time into the mother's womb and be born? Jesus Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, no one can enter the kingdom of God without being born of water and spirit. What is born of flesh is flesh. And what is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be astonished that I said to you, you must be born from above. The wind blows where it chooses, and you hear the sound of it, but you do not know where it comes from or where it goes. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus said to him, how can these things be? Jesus answered him, Are you the teacher of Israel, and yet you do not understand these things? Very truly I tell you, we speak of what we know and testifies to what we have seen, and yet you do not receive our testimony. I have told you about earthly things, and you do not believe. 
How can you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? No one has ascended into heaven except the one who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, so that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that God's only Son was given, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. come up and join me and maybe some children at heart. You're welcome to come forward. We're going to have our children's moment. So, do you guys ever create things? Yeah? yeah. yeah? What kind of stuff do you create? I like to stuff with Legos. Legos, yes. Awesome. What else do you create? Uh, I like to create like, build in Minecraft. And okay, Minecraft. There's lots of creating in Minecraft. You ever draw, color, yeah? Cool. So do I. It's a lot of fun. Play-Doh. Oh my gosh, I love Play-Doh. I went to a meeting at work recently and they busted out the Play-Doh. It was awesome. We were all like little children sniffing it. It was cool. So like, adults don't quit either. Yeah. What's the coolest thing you ever made? You made a kitty out of That's cookie so cutter cool. Play-Doh? That's awesome. Uh, really I've cool. made some really cool things in, with Legos. Like, yeah. um, I made a whole entire like, a Star Wars base. Thing. Ooh, a Star Wars base? Now you're speaking my language. I love it. May the force be with you. <laughs> and also with you, because we're in church. <laughs> what else? Anybody else have something really cool they created? Doesn't want to share? That's okay. I brought some things that were created. Okay, so this was created by a family member of mine who creates crochets. She was 16 when she made this. Isn't that cool? Want to look? Want to see? Yeah. You pass it around. I brought a very special piece that was created by my niece, Carmen, when she was eight. And it's so cool, I hang it up in my house. Isn't that fun? Wow. Yeah. And she was like, I don't like it. It doesn't, isn't anything. And I said, I love that it's not anything. It's like the 
Remember that divine dance we were talking about? It's like all the colors are just dancing. Reminded me of that. So I love it. This was created by an artist who creates, this is a Chinese art where they bend wire into things. Isn't that cool? I like turtles. I like turtles. I have a friend who creates using wood. I would be terrible at this, by the way, <clears throat> but he's really good. And I created this in art school. Yeah, you want to see? It's heavy. That was when I was learning to throw ceramics. And it's one of the pieces that I made that actually didn't break and is still intact, so that's pretty awesome. Yeah. All right. So our God is creative, too. I have a couple of things that I keep around my house to remind me of our creative God. It's a pine cone. You ever stop and look at a pine cone? They're like, they're goofy, but they're like perfect. I mean, when you look at them, they're like mathematic. I'm not a good mathematician, but I, they, I tell you there's like some sacred spiral or something that this is all patterned off of, which is super cool. It's way beyond me. God's more creative than me. It's beyond a look at the pine cone. It's like an armadillo. Do you know what this is? A shell. A shell, uh-huh. Uh, uh, what do they call the oyster? Not the oyster. It's, it's a river. Like, I got it out of Michigan rivers. These guys live in Michigan rivers. They're just little clam shells. So that's that. And you probably know what this is. Yeah, Petoskey stone. Yeah, it's a rock. Did you know that Petoskey stones are actually fossils of... You did? Okay. We got the trivia winner, Luke. Good. Um, they're they're, they're uh, fossils of coral from way back before the Ice Age when Michigan was tropical. How crazy is that? That's pretty cool. Did you know God created you? Every one of us in this room, everything in this world, it's pretty profound. Did you know that God is still creating now? Creating in our lives? Making things new? Inviting us to do it with him? I think that's pretty awesome. So pay attention to what God is inviting in your life. And helping you to create. Shall we pray together? Let's pray. Dear God, we thank you for your creativity. Thank you for helping us to be creative. Helping us to be creative. And may we be those who create love. may we be those who create love in this world with you. Amen. Amen. All right. During my seminary studies, we poured and poured and poured over scriptures, commentaries, and study notes late into the night, often in the computer lab, everywhere we went. We talked theology. I remember late nights hunched over Greek and Hebrew manuscripts and endless conversations about what this means or what that means. And of course, the ego-fueled certainty that I was right above my dissenting colleagues I knew what was correct. In fact, I had a seminary professor who once said to me, Amity, you're an interesting kind of pacifist because I think you'd kill somebody that disagreed with you. And I was like, ooh, there were days like that. So if you're watching online and you knew me from those days, I've mellowed a little. A little. I'm really grateful for that time. You know, it taught me to stop and take another look at what I thought I understood. It taught me that there was more to the scripture than face value or what someone taught me it meant. It taught me to try to find out for myself what really I understood and believed. It also taught me that you could use the Bible to say absolutely anything you wanted it to say because you could make an argument one way or the other. Case in point, I remember uh, I took this women in ministry class and I was to exegite translate, work through the scriptures um, that are called so-called problem texts that are used against women in ministry. And so all you have to do is read some scholars and basically whatever denomination they were at, they could argue, this is what the Greek means, this is what the Greek means for, against, everything in between. So how do you get your way through that, right? I mean, because really, 
you're gonna get some confirmation bias real quick. There was this one moment, though, in seminary that was very humbling. So I'm gonna credit Dr. Kimberly Majeski, if she or anyone who knows her are watching, um, for this note which humbled us all, where she said, you are scholars. So were the Pharisees. <laughs> Nothing is more humbling to one learned in the scriptures than the way that Jesus talked to Pharisees. Whitewashed tombs. Broods of vipers. I'm going to let you in on something. Actually, the brood of vipers is the PG translation, P.S. Um, what he was really saying was a very profane word for illegitimate children of the serpent tempting Adam and Eve in the garden. So he was pretty, like, not pro-Pharisee. Oofta. So what's happening there? Is it that the more we believe we know about God, the more we create an idol, a deity in our own image, who hates all the things that we hate, loves all the things that we love, and gives us an A++++ on our theology test? Perhaps that. And perhaps it's also that the more we rely on a systematic theology and on our own understanding, the less we can embrace mystery, which is where God likes to live. In our text today, Jesus was interrupted in his bedtime routine by such a scholar. Now, I don't know about you, but there's a point in the evening where please do not come calling to talk theology because the undergarments are off, I'm in my nightgown, my night mask is on, and I'm not in the mood. And I'll probably be like, hi, here's a book on boundaries. <laughs> um, so I can kind of empathize here. It's the middle of the night, and Jesus is interrupted by this scholar who is coming in the secret of the night without the eyes of his colleagues in the crowds, and who knows why. Jesus doesn't even let him get much out before he says, look, buddy. I mean, Nicodemus isn't, isn't even past blowing smoke at Jesus. Oh, you must be from God because you do all these things. You're so amazing. And he's like, Pfft. Okay, look, if, you don't, if you're not born again, you're not going to know the kingdom of God. He's just like, we're not going here. Uh, and I'm wondering how well rehearsed the speech was that Jesus cut right off. But let's try to put ourselves in that moment. It's night, it's dark, and we aren't talking glow of the street lamps dark. We're not talking Taco Bell late night run for discounts dark. We're not talking, let's go find Jesus and see if he's up for a truth or dare slumber party dark. We're talking the dark of night. In the first century world, that was a time that nothing good happened. The dark of night is black. There are no artificial lights. If you've ever been in the woods too long after the sunset, you notice that you start to not be able to see your feet on the ground or your hands in front of you. It's like that. That kind of dark in the ancient world was not the dark you went out in. You stay in. And those that are out are probably trying to catch someone who got stuck out to commit a crime or something like that. It's not a safety time. And so the fact that this is the time that Nicodemus comes out, he's not out for a late night stroll. He's deliberately coming to question Jesus at a time when no one should expect friendly visitors. And then Jesus hits him upside the head with this one. Unless someone is born again, they shall not see the kingdom of God. So cue Nicodemus going, what are you even talking about, dude? And I'm going to pause here for a second because some of us may cringe at this phrase, born again. Sometimes I do. Because it's a tool that's used for exclusion. And just a pause about that, why? Because exclusion fortifies internal connection, right? If, if we can walk around and say, if you're not born again, you're not in the club, then we have a way of being like, mm, we're the ones, you're the not. And it, it fortifies that internal group and kind of helps the reinforcement of that kind of dominance and control. So it's not like a healthy thing. It has a purpose. Most people probably don't understand what that purpose is, but it is doing something. And for those of us who are outside, we think, oh, well, 
myself. Okay, then. And I just want to say that born again is not an exclusive registered trademark of the evangelical traditions and of the altar call experience. Now, born again is not Jesus saying, unless you are a card-carrying evangelical, you don't get to heaven. He's not saying you have to speak in tongues or experience a charismatic ecstasy or have a dramatic conversion experience to go to heaven. And I came from a tradition like this. And there is beauty and good in it. So I'm not knocking that in its entirety. But any time that we say God only works this way, that's kind of the problem that the Pharisees and Nicodemus were in in the first place, right? See, God is not working in a monolithic way. Jesus says that the Holy Spirit moves like the wind. No one knows where she is coming or going. And if the wind moved in such a way that is good and beautiful and holy, but the wind has many directions, many intensities, and many purposes. And it's funny to me how even today we've managed to do this, to kind of narrow it in and talk about being born again as if it is bland and even masculine. In fact, I read a couple commentaries for this, and I was like, hmm, I like how I am looking in Google Scholar and trying to find some articles from a progressive feminist perspective, and I'm getting what Christian women should be doing if they're influencing for the gospel from the Baptist. I'm like, okay, that's number one, cool. You know, or I'm getting, you can't birth without begetting, we're going to make it about the male side again. I'm like, it's about being born again. We just ran right past that. And, you know, our our culture has this way of doing this because of where we find ourselves. But Jesus is using this image here with Nicodemus very intentionally because Nicodemus could not possibly find it palatable. God is birthing. He says, listen up. You believe you know all about God. God is a midwife. God is in the red tent hoisting a woman onto the birthing blocks, breathing with her while she squats and wails and blood and fluid is everywhere. All that stuff that is unclean and impure and no man would go near, let alone a fine upstanding man such as yourself, Nicodemus. You, Nicodemus, who comes in the night to avoid detection, let me tell you where God works in the places hidden away from the eyes of the men who know it all. Birthing was a messy, dangerous, hidden, unclean work of women in those days. It was a miracle, yes, if it resulted in a son. And if a woman didn't do it, that is, give birth, then she was certainly defunct and worthy of being thrown out. I'm one of those, by the way. We know that even today, and certainly then, birthing doesn't always result in a live, healthy baby or a mother who makes it to breastfeed or hold her child skin to skin. There can be and often is loss in birthing and grief. And God is a midwife in that sacred sadness, too. Yet birthing in its messiness is the ordinary universal thing in the world. Every person walking around has been born. To be born, a person is subject to the initiation and the acts of another person. You can't make yourself be born. (laughs) You are invited into the world by others. And so it is with God. God is calling forth new beginnings and reimaginings always. Going to the unclean places and working through the ones who've been thrown out. God is active in the mystery and the mess. The places that are bloody and painful and dangerous and holy and unseen. In our eyes and our hearts and our souls and our feet If we do not touch the messiness of this world, how do we expect to understand the heavenly things? 
to be born of both water and spirit, to live the calling of our baptism in a way which listens to the still speaking voice of God, to go out into all the world and love, love, love. Everyone, everywhere, everything. So that the wind might blow upon us a new day and justice and peace and light will reign. God is the midwife tending to the garden, gently pulling weeds and placing seeds and blessing the ground and calling, be born again. God is the midwife knocking on the closet door inviting the person hiding inside to come out and be seen, to celebrate what God has made, beckoning, be born again. God is the midwife holding the crowning head of a new dream for a new life after a bitter divorce, whispering, be born again. God is the midwife holding a fearful woman facing her cancer diagnosis, reminding her of the power of her breath and encouraging her to be born again. God is the midwife standing next to the man who lost his wife and doesn't know how he will go on alone, wiping his tears that he sheds only in secret, calling, be born again. We cannot manufacture this birthing. The Spirit will call us when it is time for life to come. Like the wind, she may whisper or roar. She may bring a warm breeze or a winter chill. But she will always hold us on the birthing bricks when the impossible is coming. She will guide us into new life. See, the lesson here with Nicodemus is that we don't always need an answer. What we need is a holy midwife. Jesus taught us not to worry about what we would eat or what we would wear or how things will work out because God takes care of the lilies and the sparrows. So, of course, God will take care of us. If we can just let go of that need to know everything, that need to be right, that need to win, we can experience the joy of God's creative work. We can be still and know. I'll close with this poem by Mary Oliver. I worried a lot. Will the garden grow? Will the rivers flow in the right direction? Will the earth turn as it is taught? And if not, how shall I correct it? Was I right? Was I wrong? Will I be forgiven? Could I do better? Will I ever be able to sing? Even the sparrows can do it, and I am, well, hopeless. Is my eyesight fading, or am I imagining it? Am I going to get rheumatism, lockjaw, or dementia? Finally, I saw that worrying had come to nothing, so I gave it up. And I took my old body and went out into the morning.
as it's Memorial Day weekend, maybe mm -hmm. say prayers for our veterans mm -hmm. and those that are serving in the service. Yes, thank you. Prayers for our veterans and those serving in service on this Memorial Day. Okay. Um, I ask prayers for Marco who's recovering from a heart attack, for Emily who's fighting stage two cancer, and Darlene who has back spasms, for cousin Ken who's doing a pilgrimage in Europe, and uh, for the family of Alice Poteet who passed recently. Mm. Um, and for our friend Kathy, who's uh, entered hospice because of Alzheimer's, and uh, Eileen's family who passed away, and for um, and all who are uh, incarcerated and uh, in rehab, and I pray for peace in Europe, in the Middle East, and in the world. Thank you. For those recovering and facing health challenges, for those who are going on to hospice, for those family members who have lost loved ones, those on pilgrimage, those incarcerated and in rehab, and for peace in Middle East Europe and in the world. Thank you. We also ask for prayers for safe travels for all of those who are traveling this busy weekend and unable to be with us today. We ask for prayers for a student of Jessica Bozinski, who is having open heart surgery on May 28th. Prayers for his medical team and recovery. We pray for friends of the Cunningham extended family who are mourning the loss of a teenager after suicide. And we ask for prayers for the passing of First Congregational Church member Wayne Leeser, who passed away on May 16th. Let us be in a spirit of prayer, and I will lead us. We will close together in whatever version of the Lord's Prayer you know and are comfortable with. Let's pray. God, the midwife, who calls forth new life in all of the unexpected places, we come together recognizing the ways in which you have worked in our lives to this point. We recognize the ways that you have given us gifts of birthing new things, of co-creating in your image in this world. We celebrate, God, those who are seeking you on pilgrimage and we ask for their guidance for their eyes to be opened and their ears to hear you. God, we lift up those who are struggling with health concerns for Marco and Emily and Darlene, for others who are facing surgery, who are facing difficult decisions, for families surrounding their loved ones in final days. We know, O oh God, that you are the great healer, the great physician, and the great lover of our souls. And you are with us. You never leave us or forsake us. So we lift our loved ones and those of concern to you, acknowledging your presence with them. God, we lift up those who are mourning the loss of a loved one, and we ask, O oh God, that you would draw near, that you would Hold them as they face an impossible challenge and that you would walk them through the spiritual journey that is grief until they are united again. We pray, God, in a special way for those who are incarcerated in rehab, those who are facing challenges, whether it's injustices, whether it's their own struggles. God, we know that you are always creating anew. We ask that you would open our eyes to the ways in which we can do better as a people, the ways in which we can do justly and love mercy and walk humbly with you. God, we pray for those on this Memorial Day who are veterans and those who are serving currently, 
in our militaries around the world. And we also pray for those who have been lost and their families. God, the cost of war is great. And we beg, O oh God, for peace to reign on this earth, in Middle East, in Europe, in the world, in all places where there is conflict. May there be a day where our swords are beaten to plowshares and there will be no need for war. We trust you that you are always with us, O oh God. And so as your disciples, we pray as Jesus taught us, our creator who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. The triune God gives with abundance for the flourishing of community. We do not receive gifts, blessings, favor, and resources for ourselves alone. We are created to be communal, compassionate, and generous. Let us bring our gifts forward with gladness and gratitude that we have the honor of participating in God's liberating and redemptive activity in this world. The ushers come forward and receive our gifts this day. join me in our prayer of dedication. Generous God, may we give gifts that are sufficient and abundant as you have provided creation with all that we need to flourish. May the fear of scarcity give way to the joy of sharing. Magnify the resources we bring as well cultivate generosity within us so that all needs are met, and all your people may be well and whole in your name. Amen. Receive this benediction. Go forth having heard the call of the Holy One. Go forth loved by the Creator, Redeemer, and Companion. Go forth strengthened by the Sender, the Sent, and the Spirit. Receive the gift of new birth and eternal life. We will testify to these things and live peaceably in God's realm. Amen.